again, welcome. Glad that you are here. Thanks for joining us, those who are in the house. Um, so if you're a dad, happy Father's Day. Uh, again, just, uh, you know, typically in churches what we do, you know, we do, uh, here we don't, we don't, I don't preach the, uh, the, the Hallmark calendar, but we do recognize Father's Day and Mother's Day, right? So typically, you know, in churches across America today, dads are are getting uh, kind of lambasted for stepping up or not stepping up or whatever. You know, step up, man, that's what we do. For our moms, we give them flowers, <laughs> you know. But not here at Grace Gospel. That's not what we do. What we do at Grace Gospel is we sugarize you, right? That's what we do, right? We just, we just have a sugarized celebration out on the lawn, and so we're still going to do that today. I was so excited that we were open up enough that we could actually still have our Father's Day uh, sugar fest. Although I've I've never preached after being sugared up like that before, so the eleven o'clock service might be interesting. Just saying, you might want to watch. It might be fun for those who are in. You know, it just might be interesting. But guess what? We're gonna we we do sugar you up, but we're also gonna challenge you to step up, dads and and moms, and uh, you know to be what we need to be in Christ. So so how do we step up for our kids? How do we step up? Well, we do that first by living the truth. And then teaching the truth. And, and it really becomes as simple as that. Although that's not very simple, is it? We, we know that because we're human and we struggle with living out this truth. We struggle with living out the, the hope of Christ. And, and honestly, we struggle with teaching it. I mean, listen, I've been, I, I, you know, I have uh, three boys in my home, right? 23 years old is the oldest and so for 23 years, practically, all right, so let's say we started when they were three or four, you know, so 20 or so years, we've struggled with how do we continue devotions in a house? How do we continue to make sure that we're constant on the things that we do with our boys? How do I take time out, and how do I teach them, and how do I grow them to be men of God? Our prayer, our prayer from before Joshua was born, you know, when he was conceived, when Andrew was conceived, we prayed from that moment on that they would know the Lord, that they would walk in truth, that they would walk and, and, and be men of God. Well, we didn't know they were men when they were in the womb because we didn't check on that kind of stuff back then. I didn't. We didn't want to. Um, but, you know, when they be, you know, men of God, that's what we wanted. Right? We wanted men who loved Jesus. We didn't want men uh, who, you know, Jesus was just an answer to a test or an answer in Sunday school, or an answer in youth group, right? We wanted a personal relationship with Jesus. And, uh, and again, how do we do that? We, we, we live the truth, and we teach the truth. The problem is, is that we live in a time today where it seems that truth is really hard to grab, right? You know, it's almost like what Pilate said when Jesus talked about the truth. He said, what is truth? What is truth? And, and today we struggle in our society. Our kids struggle. But you know what? Not only our kids, us as adults, we struggle with grappling what the truth is. We have, we have information overload. We have information immediate, right? So we see something immediately on a screen and we jump to a conclusion about what it is. We don't investigate first. We don't try to get the whole picture. We don't wait until the whole video comes out. If it, you know, all the stuff that's going on. And we assume we know truth and then we don't always know truth. And then not only that, but we're struggling in our society today with what is truth. I mean, what is the truth? of how we're to live and, and where we're to go. And I think what is, what is so timely about this is that uh, Paul's dealing with the same issue with Timothy in Ephesus. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to 2 Timothy as we continue in this study of 2 Timothy. So uh, uh, Troy did a great job of bringing us back. It had been a long time. We had done two chapters months ago. Right? And then we got brought back into this, and um, I'll remind you that contextually what Paul is dealing with is, um, is a society you know, that's focusing on, on moral decline, or, or there's, a, there's a moral decline within this society, and, and, and it's a struggle. We know that it's our struggle. If you look in the beginning of chapter 3, look at what it says again, I'll remind you. 
chapter 3, verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. And then he says, avoid such men as these. Well, I'm here to tell you, our world is full of these people. I mean, full of them. As a matter of fact, you know what is a sad commentary, uh, but it is the truth. Our churches are full of them across America and across the world. Our churches are full of people, and we've tried to talk about this a lot. We don't want you just to come in and punch your card on a Sunday morning. We don't want this to be a religious activity that you come. We come because Christ commands us to not forsake the assembling together, that we need each other in our growth in Jesus Christ. We need this time and these times like this, right? We need these times. We need these things um, to grow in Christ, and we need them together. And so we can't forsake that. We don't, we don't come just to punch our card. We don't think, all right, well, I've done my Sunday duty. And now I can go live however I want to go live in the rest of the week. No, 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 no. Sunday is a, a catalyst of, of, of making sure that we're on track. And then we need to be checking in regularly with God. I love that song that we sang, Just Be, right? I love that song. Just be before your God. Just love your God. Just honor your God. Just Want to worship? You know, worship is not what happens on Sunday morning only. It's not music time. Although we call it worship, you know, we, we, we've labeled it worship, but that's not because that's what it is, because we could do all of this, we could play all the songs, and no worship happen, because worship flows out of the heart. It flows out of who we are. And so that's our issue, man. We're, we're, we're living in this culture, in this society that is, um, that is not focused on God, that doesn't lead us to the Lord, that doesn't challenge us in Christ, right? The decline is pretty bad. We all know this. It's all around us. It's all around us. And, and, and here's some encouragement in, in Christ. Verse 13. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Guess what? It's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. Praise the Lord. Amen. As Troy said, I think, when he read it last week, let's go home. All right, we're done. No, not quite the encouragement that we'd like to see, not quite the encouragement that we'd like to have, but that's the reality of it. They're, they're being, they, they keep deceiving and they keep on being deceived. So how can I be kept from deception? Now, in church, because we know the answer to everything is what? Jesus. All right, only a few of you are brave enough. You're like, I hope I get this right. I don't... <laughs> like the answer in church is Jesus. That's always it. All right, I'll tell my old joke. Um, if you've been here before, you heard this or a while ago probably, but... Uh, the you know, pastor was sitting in service, and he had a children's time. So the children would come up. Remember children's messages that they used to have in church? And we don't do that here, but, you know, children's messages. And so he, he brought the kids up, and, and all the little kids are standing around him. And he says, he says, all right, now I'm thinking of something, I'm thinking of something brown and furry. And they kind of look at him. He's like, all right, all right, I'm thinking of something kind of brown and furry with a long tail, and, and he's small. And they kind of look at him. And they say, right, I'm thinking of something brown, furry, with long tail and small, and he scurries around all over the place, climbs trees, and they're just looking at him. You know, and he, he gathers nuts, you know, and they're just looking at him. They're like, like, and nothing. Like, no, no, come on, guys, you, you know what it is. And, and finally, one kid gets brave enough, and he says, Pastor, listen, um, we know the answer is Jesus, but it sounds like a squirrel. <laughs> all right, so the answer in church is always Jesus, right? Uh, so why doesn't Paul in this passage, you would think what happens next is, what Paul says is, so focus on Jesus. If you want to be kept from deception, focus on Jesus. You know, just keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And listen, that's a great answer, right? Hebrews 12, 
to fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. But I need you to see where Paul goes here because what we're looking for is we're looking for the standard of truth and how we keep from being deceived in this world, which is, I'm going to tell you, pretty easy. We have Christians all over the place being deceived constantly. And we're buying into the lie. And we're buying into what people are saying. And it, it sounds really good. You know, when Job's friends came to Job and, they, and they, the best thing they did was sit for seven days and not say a thing. And then the problem is they opened their mouth. Right? And when they opened their mouth, everything that came out of it sounded good and correct. And the only problem with it was that it was wrong. Patently false. Sounded good. Sounded true, but it wasn't. So guess what? We don't even, we don't even need to look to the preacher. You know, we've got to find truth, and we've got to find pastor, and, and hopefully pastors can lead us, and other people can lead us in Christ. But the problem is, there's a source of truth that's not me, right? That's not the position of pastor. We're not the fount of truth. We can only expound on the truth. We can only bring out the truth, open it up, and show it as it is. And so look at what he does. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. He says, you, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures, which were able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So the key to this passage is, the key to this word right here, is, that, and you need to understand this, is that all scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is God-breathed. That is the key to this passage. All scripture is God-breathed. Literally, God-breathed. That's what it means. When it says, all scripture is inspired by God, in the Greek, it literally says, it is God-breathed. It is from God. And so the Bible is true, and the Bible is our authority, because it is God-breathed. It's not because it sounds good. It's not because it sounds true. It's not because, like, well, you know, it worked for me when I tried it. That's not the reason. Scripture's not right or wrong based on whether, you know, we tried to live it out and it worked or didn't work for us at the moment. And too often, that's the way we handle Scripture. Too often, that's the way we do. And so as the authoritative word of God, as, as, the, as, the, as the very words of God to us, they are indeed truth. They're truth. They give us our standard for living and who we are and what we need to be. And so that's why, you know, and, and again, we, we need to focus on Jesus. We need to continue in relationship with Jesus. I had somebody a long time ago. I mean a long time ago. I was a, a pretty new pastor at the time, back in the day. Uh, when were you born, Troy? Never mind. Uh, it was probably after Troy was born, but it wasn't long <laughs> after. Um, and somebody said to me, um, you know, I think prayer is more important than reading God's word. You know, if, you're, if you had to do one or the other, praying is more important than reading God's word. And there was a context wrapped around that, understand that. But um, I, was, I was young, uh, but still pretty bold, and I told him he was nuts, basically. Nuts. And listen, that's not the, listen, prayer is vital in the life of a believer, okay? Please don't hear me saying, well, prayer is not important. That's not what I'm saying. You know, that connection with God is vital. But the problem is, if I don't know God's truth, if, if God's truth is not informing my prayers, it's not informing, what I'm going to hear is not from the Holy Spirit. I'm going to hear from my flesh. 
And it's going to sound like the Holy Spirit because it's a familiar voice to me, but it's my own. And so we can't buy into this, that the fact that we, we've got to know there's no substitute for knowing God's word. None. Zero. Okay? And again, you know, in, in, in even good churches like ours, right, we, it's very important. We preach out of it. We, 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 we study through books. We, you know, we want to let the word speak and not us speak and, and all that. But too often, too often, too many of us are not diving into God's word. We're diving into other people's interpretation of God's word. I mean, we'll listen. I know people who say, yeah, I just, I listen constantly to podcasts of pastors. And that can be great. That can, all right, I'm not saying that's bad. But the question is, when do you dive into God's word? Well, it's just easy to listen to as I'm driving down the road. Well, get this. Go on your phone, right? You version. You can go listen to God's word as you're driving down the road. And when you miss it, what's really cool is you can you know, go back and listen to it again and listen to it again and listen to it again. We live in a great time with lots of tools if we'll use them. If we'll use them. All right, so this morning, what I think Paul talks about in this is the authoritative word, it's, or, or, as an authoritative word, it is written for three reasons for us of what Paul talks about in this passage. To lead us to saving faith, to guide us toward godliness, and to equip believers for good works. That's what he talks about, right? That's directly out of the passage. All right, so let's talk about that. We're going to break that down this morning. We're just going to walk through, and we're going we're gonna to talk about Scripture. And the problem is, I, you know... The problem with talking about Scripture in this way is it can become very academic. That does no good if you don't put it into practice. And putting into practice this morning, I'm going to tell you the point right from the very beginning. Putting into practice is going home and diving into the Word of God. And, and I don't mean just today. I mean, that's great that you would go home today and read a chapter of, of God's Word. I mean every day, diving in and letting it feed you. All right? So, first thing Scripture does is scripture leads us to the truth. Leads us to truth. Um, again, remember our context. So Paul is, is um, worried about falling into the declining moral society. Worried about falling into the deception that's all around. And he talks about it in other places, in Thessalonians, other places. You know, don't get deceived. Don't get caught up. Don't, get, don't, don't let your mind go. Stop being deceived. And again, there's only one way to do that, and that you've got to know God's word. We have people in churches today that are being deceived by men and, and women who call themselves pastors. And they're speaking a word, and it sounds really good, and it sounds very practical, but it's not what he says. And so there's absolutely no substitute for knowing God's word, none. None. Scripture gives you the wisdom that leads you to salvation through faith. He says that, right? The wisdom that, that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That the reality of the, the truth of God, that Jesus is actually called the Word. You realize that? The manifestation of God on this earth. And he came for us, and he came to die for us that we might have life and that we might know wisdom, that we might know what is true and what is not true. I mean, listen, we like to get into books that tell us about God. Nothing wrong with reading a good book. Nothing wrong with reading a good theology book. Believe it or not, as your pastor, I hate reading theology books. I mean, they're dry, right? And, and usually they talk about something over and over, and I'm like, man, you could have said that in like two paragraphs, and you took 20 pages, right? So, I mean, but, but, we, but we, we listen to books about what it. We surround ourselves with people who tell us about God. We come to church, and we listen to it. You know, we want the pastor to tell it. Why? Because it's easier for us. It's a whole lot easier to come to church and, and have somebody tell me about God than for me to get to know God on my own. It's a whole lot easier. And listen, I get it. The older I get, the harder it is for me to stay awake when I'm sitting in a chair reading God's word. Right? Listen, I, I told you this uh, you know, a few months ago. Um, I mean, listen, I, I don't know what it is. 
I, I just, uh, I don't know. I never used to fall asleep in chairs, right? And I told you, I, I, one of the hardest places for me to stay awake is in that chair back there when I'm studying. And so we bought stand-up desks so that when I'm falling asleep, I can stand up. I mean, listen, grab your Bible and go walk around the house with it. I don't care. I get that you fall asleep. I get it. You're old. It's just what happens. Sorry. Uh, I'm with you, though. I'm with you. All right. Um, no substitute for that, right? We can't. And Because here's the issue. If you don't know God's word, if I go off the reservation, how are you going to know that I'm going off the reservation? How are you going to know that? If you're listening to people and, and, and they're just off the reservation, they're going off, off text, off scripture, off of what God's word says, how are you going to know? How are you going to know? And I'm here to tell you, there have been big churches in our country, and, and we've seen this. Uh, last year was a bad year for the church for some big names who renounced Jesus and renounced that, that Christ was the only way to salvation, who were leading big ministries. And the problem with is some people went with them. That's a problem. Because the church isn't built around a person. Not, I mean, not a, not a human being living on the earth today, I should say, because it's built around Jesus, right? But it's not built around me. It's not built around you. It's not built around our opinion. I always get worried when someone says to me, well, you know, I tend to like this person. You know, listen, I think David Jeremiah is great. He's not the prophet of God. I think Charles Stanley is great. He's not the prophet of God. Name a few, Chuck Swindoll, uh, I don't even know. Matt Chandler, I like Matt Chandler. You know, Tony Evans, oh, I love Tony Evans. They're not the prophet of God. They're not. And I really get worried when someone says, well, I really follow this person's teaching. Don't follow that person's teaching. Follow Scripture's teaching. Follow God's word. And yes, if that person is a faithful servant that does a great job of accurately reflecting God's word and helps you to understand it better and helps you to apply it better, by all means, listen. By all means. But always listen with a discerning ear to the truth, right? So because Scripture leads us to that. Scripture is the standard. And there is no other. If you're just listening to somebody else, the only hope that you have is that that person is giving you an accurate synopsis or an accurate reflection of Scripture. And again, like I said, the problem is if you don't know God's Word, how do you know? It's kind of like me taking my car to the mechanic. All right, I have a very limited knowledge, especially today. Forget it. Right? I mean, nothing's mechanical anymore. Right? I don't, you know, I don't know what codes mean. We can read codes. I don't know. They don't mean nothing to me. Right? And reality is a code could be because of something else down the line. And so if a mechanic tells me, if I take my car someplace and I, and I um, you know, he tells me something or they tell me something about my car, I'm kind of at a loss to be able to challenge them on that. The only thing I can go with is whether it feels right or not. And the problem is, is that my feelings aren't always accurate. I mean, listen, I, I think there is something to the Spidey sting, tingle. If you've not seen the Marvel movies, or not even Marvel, sorry. You don't know those. You know, it is Marvel. Spider, the Spidey tingle. You know, if you don't, you know, if something's not like, there, there is something about that. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. But like, if you're not then going to a source of truth to check on that, then all that's left is your emotion. And I'm here to tell you, our emotion is wrong. Often. 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 We got to be careful of that. So scripture leads you to truth. Why? Because it is God-breathed. Because it is God-breathed, it leads us to the truth. And so therefore, we've got to know it. All right, secondly, scripture guides us in the truth. It guides us toward godliness, it talks about. Because it's God's word and it's not man's opinion, it is then the only suitable tutor for us in our spiritual preparation. 
It's, our, it's the only suitable tutor. It's really the only suitable tutor. And again, I know Scripture talks about discipling others and, 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 and you know, walking with them in the faith, and that's vital. But it's only vital as I lead them to Christ, not to me. That's the difference. We're not making disciples of ourselves. We're making disciples of Jesus. And so he says in this word that it's profitable for, for four things in four ways. First, it's profitable for teaching. In other words, it helps us to know what to believe. Right? God's word has got to be the core of our beliefs. It has got to be the core of our beliefs. It must, it must dictate our beliefs. God's word has to be what drives what we believe and what we don't believe. Again, if, it, if not, then it's simply left to our feelings. All too often, we, we, we come to what we think we should believe, and then you know, we, we kind of get our opinion first, and then we read it into Scripture. It's kind of like what's happening in our world today, where if you see a little snippet of a video... You make up your mind, and then when you see the whole video, you go, well, how is it not clear to somebody? And they say, oh, no, 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 that's not what happened, because they've already made up their mind. And so what we do is we make up our mind about what God is or what God should say or what God's word should say, and then when we read something that might diverge from that, we're like, oh, no, no, it doesn't really mean that. It means this, and if you've got to read this and you've got to see that. You can't do that. You have to allow Scripture to do that. We can't, we can't allow our patterns of, of belief to dictate what Scripture says. We can't allow that. Scripture has to dictate. What, and, and listen, I get that it's confusing, and there are times when, you know, I, I can have a hearty discussion with somebody that I might disagree with in some things, and I got no issue with that as long as we're both using Scripture. But too often what happens is somebody starts off with Scripture and then they say, well, but my experience was. Well, your experience doesn't confirm Scripture. It never does. I mean, it might reflect Scripture, yes, but, but your experience doesn't mean that it must be this way because I experienced it that way. We've got to dive into the truth, and we have to allow it to help us to know what to believe, and we need to allow Scripture alone to drive our doctrine. Scripture alone. All right, secondly, it's useful for rebuking. In other words, it notice, notifies us of when we're straying. When we get off, it, it notifies of that. It, it convicts us of our sin, is what it says. And why does it do that? Because Scripture, it, it, the way it describes in Amos is that it's a plumb line. So Jimmy's a carpenter. Not only does he make beautiful music, but he makes beautiful things, right? And he does make beautiful things, by the way. Um, but um, so carpenters, if, if you have a carpenter that never takes out a level to check something, I don't care how good their eye is. Listen, right? Level is level, Right, so a plumb line is just a, a weight on the bottom of a string, and they would drop it and let it stop swinging, and that would be straight. And that's how they would know if everything was straight. Because the reality is, sometimes our eye is off. No matter how good you are, sometimes our eye is off. So we need scripture to say, oh, what is the plumb line? What is the level? What is the straight? Here. And then when we come to Scripture and something is off, guess what's not off? Scripture's not off. We're off. If, if, if something is a little bit amiss with the way we live, with the, what we do, with what we believe, when it comes to Scripture, it doesn't mean that I need to make Scripture fit me. That's how houses collapse. That's how things bend, and, and you go, how did that happen? So Scripture is useful for rebuking. It doesn't mean that it's useful so that I can just throw it out and beat somebody over the head with it. That's not what it's talking about. But it does mean that when we correct, trust too often even in the church, when we correct, we're not correcting in Scripture. When you correct as a parent, you just go, no, that's wrong. Well, why is it wrong? Why is lying wrong? If it, if, it, if it 
makes me get out of trouble, doesn't that mean it's okay? If you're not going back to the source as a parent for all those things, then, then all you're going to do is you're leaving your child to argue with your wisdom versus somebody else's wisdom. And I promise you, when they get out into the world, somebody else's wisdom is going to sound better than yours. So it's useful for teaching, for rebuking. Then it says for correcting, right? So it notifies us of straying, but it also brings us back to the truth. It literally means the restoration of, of, uh, to an upright position or an upright state. So, it, so in other words, when we find that something's off, well, we don't just go, eh, it'll be fine, right? I hope Jimmy doesn't do that, right? He when he builds, he doesn't do that. Yeah, you know what? You'll hardly notice it, right? Now, get this. I, I know when he builds sometimes, you know, he goes into a house and has to restore something, and it's already off kilter, and he can't fix it, right? And so then he has to make it good to the eye. But if you're building something new and it's off a little bit, kilter, everything is going to be off kilter, right? And so what you need to do is before you move on, when you find it, you need to correct it. And Scripture is able to bring us back to that place of truth. It's able to bring us back into plumb, into level with God to make sure that we're walking in him. i got to tell you, so that means that, well, well let's walk on, and I'll, I'll do this. All right, so not only that, but it's good for training in righteousness. In other words, it teaches what our actions should be. So to, to understand what should be done, how we should behave, you know, it, it tells us how we should behave, what our priorities, what our focus should be. What kind of things should I be focusing on in this world? What kind of actions should I be concentrating on? Again, too often what we do is we think, well, whatever works for me. As long as it it makes me get out of trouble or it gets me ahead or it helps me to get someplace, that's all that matters. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not all that matters. The ends never justify the means. We had a discussion at men's meeting the other night, and I was trying to, to, to just, well, just start discussion. And so, you know, you throw out things and whatever. But um, in the end, I, I had to say, I don't even know what I was trying to say, but the ends don't justify the means. Christian, the ends never justify the means. Never. Never. Well, it doesn't matter if I fudge it a little here. As long as it works out in the end, that'll be all right. No. See, we're not being built, we're, we're not being built on our own, right? We're not even being built into our own house. So my, my favorite Bible verse for the church on Sunday mornings, you know, is 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at what it talks about when, it, when he, what he's building and what we're being built into. He says, it's coming to him as a living stone which has been rejected but is choice and precious in the sight of God. 2 Peter 2, 5, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. God's building his church to be what he wants it to be, to exalt him and to point others to him. That's what he's building his church into. We're we're being built into a spiritual house that might offer spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord. How can God's spiritual house be off kilter? We can't. We cannot be off kilter. We cannot be. Wayne Grudem, when it talks about the sufficiency of Scripture, says this. The sufficiency of Scripture means that Scripture contained all the words of God he intended his people to have at each stage of redemptive history. And that it now contains everything we need, we need God to tell us for salvation, for trusting him perfectly, and for obeying him perfectly. Scripture is sufficient to come to him in salvation and to live out our salvation before others. And I got to tell you, you can get yourself a good pastor who speaks great words, but if he's not speaking God's words, then he's not a great pastor. I don't care how good he is. 
I don't care how many followers he has. I don't care how many people or how much money or how many buildings or how many whatever they have. You are an illegitimate teacher in Christ. So this means not only on the pulpit, that means in Bible study, that means in other places. You are illegitimate if you are not teaching the word of God. Illegitimate. So it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. And then finally, so Scripture leads you to the truth. It guides you in the truth. And then Scripture equips us in the truth. He says, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So in other words, by doing these things, by by allowing Scripture to inform your walk and by allowing Scripture to measure up, by coming to God honestly and allowing Scripture to tell you what is right and what is wrong, what is off, what is what is not off, allows you to, you know, teaches you what plum is and what not plum is, that by doing that, you might become useful. It equips you for spiritual life. And I love that. It's it it, it equips you, you become adequate. Now we don't like that word adequate, do we? Who wants to be adequate here, right? I mean, nobody wants to be, I want to be exceptional, right? And so that's all our, 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 our terminology today is all about exceptional, all about this and all about that, right? No, no, listen. If I'm going to be useful to God, equipped for every good work, I need his word to make me adequate, to make me able. Adequate simply means that you are able to do the job that is before you. And I, and I get that we put that on the bad side of it, but it's not a bad word. We've made it into that, that adequate. Well, you know, he's, how, how, how is this employee? Well, they're adequate, <laughs> which basically means in our world, you know, they show up most of the time, you know, kind of thing. Um, that's not what he's talking about, right? Adequate. Literally, what it means is to be complete, capable, proficient, able to meet all demands. That's what adequate means. Let me say it again. Adequate means literally complete, capable, proficient, able to meet all demands. Scripture makes us into men and women of God who look like Jesus. And again, I know we say, well, well, and 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 it's a good word, Hebrews chapter 12, fixing our eyes on Jesus. We're gonna run this race with endurance. You know, uh, casting aside all the sin and, the, and, and everything that entangles us and all that kind of stuff. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. I know we need to do that. But I'm here to tell you, if you're just looking at Jesus, you know, I'm just, I'm just having this spiritual moment. We walk around kind of in this spiritual haze, which some people do, right? You know, in this spiritual haze and kind of, I just want to love Jesus. I just want to love Jesus. I just want to love Jesus. And... And then we begin to do things, and they feel like what Jesus would do. I got to tell you, so, so a, a long time ago, right, um, Sheldon, I forget his first name, last name, I mean, um, wrote a book, uh, What Would Jesus Do? That's not, that wasn't the name of the book. I forget the name of the book. But that's, what, that's where that phrase came out of, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? I'm here to tell you, if, if, if all you're relying on is your feeling about what Jesus would do, you're going to get off, off course. There's a lot of people espousing a lot of things that are not true, talking, and, and what they do is they talk about, well, would, I don't think Jesus wouldn't, would, would, would not like this. I mean, Jesus just loves love. He's just love. That's all he is. He's love. And so he's going to love everybody, and he's not going to send anybody to hell, and he's not going call, to call anything wrong, and he's not going to call, you know, listen, that's what we do, because it feels like it should be that way. But if your feeling of what, if, if that question is not asked with an information of Christ, what would Jesus do? I'm here, you're going to go off stray. You're going to go off the reservation. And you're going to go off quickly and you're going to go off far eventually. It doesn't start off far at first, right? But eventually you do. Listen, we need to be a people of the word of God. And I know, I know that, that some even in this room or some listening don't want to be told, go back and read your word daily or on a regular basis. Read your word so that you can know God. Start, if you've never read God's word, read the book of John. 
I've had people that we've talked about for leadership positions, and you go, have you ever, have you, you read the whole Bible? No. You, you read the whole New Testament? No. Like, what? How are you going to be able to inform the church if you don't even know what God's word says? Well, but I took a course in theology. I don't care. I don't care. Go read God's word. You know, and I get we start all kinds of plans all over the place, but, but I don't start a plan. Read it on a regular basis. Study his word. Let him inform you because that is the truth. And so when Timothy says you don't want to get, and when, when Paul says to Timothy, don't get, don't get caught up in this moral decline that's around us. Church, don't get caught up in this moral decline that's around us. Go to God's word. And allow it to inform what you believe, what you do, what you say, who you are, everything. Because it's useful for teaching, rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that you might be adequate, equipped for every good work. Let me pray. Father God, I love you so much. I thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you didn't leave us on our own, that you didn't leave us by ourselves, Lord, that you gave us truth, that you gave us your words so that we might, might know what is true, that we might know what is plumb, that we might know how to walk in you, that we might be able to walk strong and that we might be able to stand firm, even against the world that might, might completely tell us something different. It might even feel different, but Lord, let us stand on you. And let us stand on your truth, on your word, on the rock. And let us not go astray. Father, I love you so much. I thank you so much for your grace and mercy. I thank you for what you give us, that we are your children in your glory. I love you, Lord. And I thank you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray.